you're looking at is not an FXR. That's a Buell Super Cruiser. It's an FXR killer. But before we can even discuss that, we have to understand what is the FXR and how did we get here? So we're gonna turn the clocks back to 1981. The courtship, the love affair between a man and a machine can be a beautiful thing. It may a lame. You see, in the early 1980s, Harley Davidson was not doing so hot. It was not the Harley Davidson you and I know today. It was owned by a parent company called AMF, which stands for American Machine and Foundry. And let me tell you, they had no business building motorcycles. They dealt with sporting goods equipment like tennis rackets and bowling machines and stuff. And Harley was getting their butt kicked by foreign import motorcycles, the likes of Kawasaki, Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, and even some European brands. American celebrities were choosing these bikes over Harley Davidson. People like John Wayne, the Beatles, and other celebrities. It was embarrassing. That's because AMF rescued Harley in the late 60s from the same event. This person doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Been watching him for weeks. Know every step to his cook. Oh! And during the 70s and early 80s, the only thing AMF did was widen the profit margins, lower the quality, streamline production, and just strung Harley along. In the early 1980s, profits were falling despite Harley Davidson still somehow being number one motorcycle manufacturer in America, they decided to liquidate. In order to prevent this, 13 Harley Davidson executives came together and invested the money to purchase the company back from AMF. This resulted in the sale of the company on June 16th 1981 back to harley davidson investors with the slogan the eagle soars alone you see this was a pretty big deal in the early 1980s because america wasn't doing well economically after the carter administration it was such a big deal to see an american company get back up on its own feet and take back what was theirs even president reagan flew down to milwaukee Wisconsin, to congratulate harley davidson on their independence thank you very much special. We're on the road to unprecedented prosperity in this country, and uh, we'll get there on a Harley. Now you're probably wondering what all this has to do with the FXR, but that's just the thing. This is when the FXR was born. Now that Harley-Davidson had taken the power back, they had to show America they had balls and breathe fresh life into the company by developing new models. The first thing they did is they went to work on a model to compete with the foreign motorcycles. Something that had a big motor and could carve the twisties with some mean suspension that you could ride hours down the open freeway and get where you're going to. I'll need my news team at my side. So they assembled a team of the best engineers at Harley to do what had to be done to create the bike that had to be made. And that team was led by Steve Persh and included Bill Brown, Rip Ruth, Eric Buell, we'll get back to him, Bob Leroy, and several others. If you know the several others, please comment below. I did a lot of digging, couldn't find him. So the team went to work on what is considered by all accounts an engineer's bike. One of the best handling Harley Davidsons to date, the FXR. FX was the designator for custom chassis. R was the designator for rubber mounted motor. The FXR was essentially an FLT touring frame tweaked to be a cruiser with a Sportster front end, a five-speed transmission, a swing arm that mounted into the frame, and a big twin motor. Woo! See, the FXR is similar to the Beetle Super Cruiser in that it's an amalgamation of things that Harley-Davidson already had on hand with some minor adjustments to make a badass touring bike. You and I are not so different. I'm not like you. It was budget friendly to the company at the time, and it came out in 1982 with a shovel head motor, just like the one behind my ear. What's also cool about this bike was every model was handmade, which is in part probably the reason it was so expensive to produce and was eventually discontinued in 1995. And don't hit me with that. Well, technically, in 1999, they made 900 more models. Because that's true, they did. And it was at that same time in the 90s that that Eric Buell guy I mentioned had gone off and already established his very own motorcycle company. They were successful, and by 1998, they had already sold over 20,000 units, and they caught the eye and attention of Harley-Davidson to the point where Harley became a majority shareholder in Buell Motorcycles. They made some cool models over the years, 
One notably was the XBR9. It came out in 2002 and it used a Harley Davidson Sportster powertrain, but what was more unique about it was that it stored the fuel in the aluminum beam frame chassis. Firebolt uses a twin spar aluminum frame, but this frame, which is made in Italy, also serves as the fuel tank, while the stiff alloy swing arm does double duty as the oil tank. And for a moment there, Buell had a pretty good run. They were embraced by the community and their bikes were seen on the streets. Sure, they didn't have the production capability like Ducati or Suzuki, but they were selling. Unfortunately, like all great companies, Buell suffocated under the weight of the 2008 financial crisis and Harley-Davidson being the majority shareholder was forced to cut ties in order to stay afloat. Eric Buell left the company in order to start Eric Buell Racing a year later and Buell Motorcycles as we know it was dead. But meanwhile on the west coast, motorcycle culture was changing. Millennials were becoming of age and the motorcycles they grew up seeing on TV and the streets were now affordable. The FXR was within reach. It was used and abundant. The West Coast specifically had created a cultural need to lane split hours comfortably through traffic, but also drag me in the canyons. It wasn't long before we started seeing videos of these motorcycles circulating in back parking lots with six suspension, MX bars, grippy seats, moto pegs, doing wheelies, burnouts. Now we live in a day and age where we can't imagine a motorcycle shop or bike meet that doesn't have a sick FXR build. And as the FXR and Dyna Bro culture as we know it today spread across the country invading city after city, trader pages and clothing companies began to brand themselves after this movement. Well that was all going on, to everyone's surprise, on February 18th, 2021, Buell announced their return. I'm not fucking leaving! <laughs> they announced four models they would be making, two of which were sport bikes, one off-road Baja Dune dirt bike racer type deal, and a sport touring bike, all of which were pretty cool, but weren't production ready, weren't being delivered to customers yet, at least for another year or so. Uh, all of which use the same powertrain, a new powertrain that we hadn't seen before, that they developed previously in uh, 2007, right before the company died. Uh, none of these models though, however, competed with that performance Harley culture that had spread nationwide, so as a result, no one really batted it an eye. At least, not until two years later, when they showed people they were serious about ruffling feathers. They announced the Buell Super Cruiser in February 2023. All right, everyone, here we are eight minutes into the video and we're finally getting into the Buell Super Cruiser. What does this bike not have? This thing is bad ass, man, from suspension, wheels, motor, setup, riding position, the whole cockpit, I love it. All right, so some things that stand out to me on this bike is the GP suspension up front. Uh, they're the best of the best. If you're putting cartridges in your forks, you're going with GP. Shout out Oxnard, love them. Uh, and then other things like, a, like almost like Harley did. It's an amalgamation of things that that Buell already had on hand, and that's what Roland Sands was tasked with when he put this bike together. So we've seen that front rotor, we've seen that swing arm, rear shock, we've seen those wheels before. Uh, got meaty Dunlops on there, we like that. A Saddleman seat, crafted by Saddleman, and then the riding position, the bar setup, I think that's Goldilocks, you know, the 12 inch bars, that's right in the middle, nice and comfortable. That will be good for most people. Um, the tucked uh, foot controls, those aren't quite mids, there's almost like rear, very sport bike-esque, um, I don't have an issue with that. I know that will be bothersome on longer rides and taller riders just might not like that outright. So uh, the great thing about the Harley Davidson community and B twin is that a lot of gifted men and women that craft up badass shit in their garages and in their companies. So I'm sure the aftermarket um, controls for this bike and foot peg placement and all that will become a thing. I'm not really worried about that. 400 pounds, oh my God, can we talk about that? Um, I don't care how much uh, carbon fiber you put on your bagger. I don't care what kind of you know, caveman carnivore diet you do in the gym or what have you. You're not losing 200 pounds off your bike. This thing is light and ready to rip and you can't compete with that. And it's liquid cooled and it makes more horsepower than anything we got out there. This thing's badass, man. The soft tail cannot compete. The new soft tail cannot compete. 
because the Softail was not an answer to the FXR. The Softail was a much needed and ready replacement for the Dyna, and it did its job. The Softail is good, but not as good as this. So I can't wait to see people mess with this. I can't wait to see aftermarket products um, created for this. And then what I'm most excited for is uh, two things here, all right? So one is very obvious and the other one's more specific to me. So the first one being, they are delivering these direct to consumer. I think that's more important than ever. And we've seen that in the past two years with auto manufacturers and motorcycle manufacturers because they've kind of been predatory with the supply chain and dealership markups kind of messed up what they've been doing to people out there. And again, not all dealerships are built the same. Some are franchised out uh, and are really good to the community. So that's gonna be case by case with the city you live near. But um, I am excited to see them deliver direct to consumer. So that should save us, the consumers, a, a buck or two, right? And then the second silver lining is the insurance aspect. So Harley guys can definitely relate to this as you put aftermarket products and crafted things on your bike. Uh, when you mess up your bike, you know, you probably have some good coverage on there because you put your heart and soul into it and then you try to make a claim and you don't have invoice or paperwork uh, for your insurance company to compensate you for those aftermarket products. Again, some of them are cool and they might compensate you anyways. Or others, I'm not gonna name names, might uh, give you a tougher time. You know, they, they wanna see paperwork and a lot of the stuff I bought for my bikes was uh, cash or on the trader page or given to me or traded, um, stuff like that. So. That's kind of an interesting aspect that it's coming from the manufacturer this way. Pretty much good to go. People will still mess with it, but you know, you could leave your bike alone and it's still pretty rad. So that's pretty cool. And then the third one, um, my only complaint is that little, little Casio type display there for your, your tack and your speed and all that stuff. Um, looks a little old, looks a little eight to 10 years old. I, I was hoping for uh, something a little bit more decoded digital, a little bit more uh, modern so who knows maybe maybe down the line by the time it comes out things could be different we do have to expect that by the time this gets released um, two years from now it might not be the same bike if it gets released at all so if you're placing your early pre-order best of luck to you I know I am I'm excited for this fingers crossed let me know what you think in the comments below like subscribe give me your input I worked really hard on this video I hope you guys liked it I try to be accurate as I could and I'll catch you in the next video For those of you out there who are saying, the idiot talk about the Dyna. What about the Dyna? I had a Dyna for a little over six years. It's a great bike, definitely had a part in this culture, uh, but the FXR came first and the FXR doesn't do this. So the Dyna, bro, doesn't even compete with this Super Cruiser.